I guess you're about the only person around that doesn't have TV coverage of the scene. That's all right, I don't mind a bit. Yeah, I don't know. Oh, it's beautiful, Mike. It really is. Oh, geez, that's great. Is the lighting halfway decent? Yes, indeed. They've got the flag up now, and you can see the stars and stripes from up. Okay, I can leave that one foot up there, and uh, both hands down about the fourth rung up. There you go. Okay, now I think I'll do the same. For anyone who goes on another EVA stroll back on the moon or on Mars, and we'll do both one day, I, I know that'll happen, take duct tape. Before NASA reenacted the whole thing officially, we had already conducted our own experiment. Here we are in our London studio in 1G, complete with an atmosphere. There they go. As you can see, the feather and the hammer arrive on the ground at the same time. Now if we slow it down by the appropriate amount, lo and behold, these two items fall nice and slowly as per a 1 6 G environment. This illusion is all about calibration. Sorry, sorry. Do you see oh, like yeah. the bright light back wow. there? Incredible. Wow. Wow. Still see it? That yep, yep, awesome. it's in the camera. Yeah. Look how fast that's going, man. Look how fast. Are you getting it on video? Yep. Yeah, folks, we're still going off the right side of the aircraft right now. Let's see the right side of the aircraft. You can see the spaceship. Wow. If you on the left side of the aircraft, you can probably see people on the right side of the aircraft looking at the spaceship. rockets they always take off and they always go up and for a bit and then they go on the back or sideways well again uh, you've got billions of budgets you're all scientists you're all really clever hopefully you're a lot cleverer than me you've got you know all these mathematics degrees you know calculus and everything else can you not 
because I believe rocket fuel is very expensive. So why don't, why doesn't it go straight up? Well, because it's such, well, wait, to, to, to put on the right place on Earth at the right time, so that all you have to do is go straight up, straight out, because you're going out. Yeah, go straight up, straight out. They never, ever, ever do it. They always go on the back in the distance. When you're doing a spacewalk on orbit, you're in your own spaceship. It's your spacesuit, but it keeps you from the vacuum outside and your crewmates inside the space shuttle. In the Gemini days, when they were trying to do the first spacewalks from a, a capsule, uh, the first EVAs, the first spacewalks, were not very uh, productive. The crew members got outside, they didn't have anything to hold on to, they kind of flailed around, uh, they couldn't do fairly simple tasks. And uh, they learned from that that they had to have a better way to train, and they started to use water tanks at that time. Well, it is a giant swimming pool, but what it is is it allows us to train astronauts to go outside and do EVA, which is essentially spacewalks. <laughs> Here's where they simulate fixing a space shuttle, fixing the ISS, or working with other modules. It is. It's the same suit. It's a suit that was on station that has been decommissioned. Uh, yes, uh, some things have been made different for the water, like we use umbilicals up in space. They don't have that. Uh, in space, they have a computer on their chest. We have a mock-up that helps us uh, weigh them out, either by putting foam on it or by weight on it, depending on the subject. Uh, astronauts can be in these suits in space, 8 to 10 hours. Mm -hmm. In our pool, they're in for 6 hours at a time. How does this facility, how does being underwater, what do you do to make it simulate gravity, zero gravity as much as possible? Well, we have the three-dimensional axis. They can go up, they can go down, they can go left, they can go right, they can turn upside down. Uh, so it's the closest thing that we can simulate right now. Part of our job as a safety diver, make sure if they roll on their back, they stay on their back. They put their legs up, their legs stay in the position that they put them in. Uh, we want to make sure that whatever axis they go in, they're going to stay pretty much right there. So there's a team of divers here whose job is to basically swim around the astronauts as they're in their suits and to assist them in simulating that experience. Yeah. Once weighted properly, the astronauts hover in the water as if floating in the weightlessness of space. Since fins don't work in space, the astronauts don't get to wear them here. They must be moved from task to task by the divers. test conductor and team speak directly to the astronauts through the communications gear in their helmets. But powerful underwater speakers allow the divers to hear everything that's being said, even if they can't talk back. Let's go ahead and swim EV1 over to Z1 to 
to check out EV2's API bar addressing. After a couple hours of training, the divers move one of the astronauts over to the platform and remove her glove. This training exercise simulates a suit failure, and it's one of the things that astronauts practice underwater. I felt something that was not un unexpected. I felt cold water on the back of my hand, and, and that surprised me. Uh, did he ever? About a gallon of water actually seeped inside his helmet. Still unclear if it came from his cooling system or from his drinking system, but as you might imagine, Martha, NASA wants to figure that out before they send somebody out outside again mm. to have the same thing happen all wow. over again. Scary story. Glad he made out okay. Trace, yeah. thank you very much. The ground doesn't have a lot of information on the suit. They, they can monitor some things. They have telemetry about my status, my battle status, and they, they know how the suit is performing. But a lot of things we, we couldn't tell at that point. Okay, so where did the water come from? Apparently from the cooling system in Luca's spacesuit, which had started leaking. Both being outside in my spacesuit, but I was also sensorially isolated. I couldn't see, uh, and I, I couldn't hear, and, and I didn't quite know where I was, how to, uh, to find my way back to the, to the airlock. At that point, it, it was obvious to me that I needed to, to go back to the airlock by myself and do it as fast as I could because I could still breathe through my mouth, but I didn't know how much water was in the helmet and I didn't know if there would be more water in the helmet. Thankfully, we, we spent hundreds of hours underwater in the neutral buoyancy lab learning the configuration of the space station, learning how to use our spacesuit, learning how to navigate. And so using, using that experience and using my knowledge of the suit and everything I had with me, I was able to, to find my way in, in the dark, in the blind, um, back to the airlock. You gotta tell me what it's like to be in space. <laughs> What's it like to be in space? Well, it's, kind of, it's a lot like being in the pool here. The only difference is when you turn upside down in the pool, you feel upside down. When you turn upside down in space, you, you don't, there is no upside down, so you, so you, don't, you don't feel that, have that sensation of blood rushing to your head, and uh, you can't beat the view. There was uh, one time when I was on the end of the mechanical arm, it was on the Hubble mission, and I was being moved from one place to another, and you really have no sensation of movement when you're on that arm. It's just so smooth. Um, there's nothing. There's no drag of the water pulling you back, and so you don't really know you're moving. Um, and I was just, I was working on the tools. I was putting the sockets on for the next whatever task I had to do next. And the guys stopped, it and they said, "You have to look at this. You just have to stop and look." And so I stopped and looked, and we were over the Gulf of Mexico. We could see the entire of North America, and we could see aurora up over Canada, and it was just an amazing. You have no sensation of movement when you're on that arm. It's just so smooth. Um, there's nothing, there's no drag of the water pulling you back, and so you don't really know you're moving. I just saw a UFO! Oh my God, what an unbelievable coincidence. I was just telling Fez about how dumb you are. Earth spins at 1,040 miles per hour, while the Earth travels around the Sun at 66,000 miles per hour. Meanwhile, the whole solar system is going inside the Milky Way galaxy at a speed of 490,000 miles per hour. And finally, the entire Milky Way galaxy is darting through infinite space at over 1 million miles per hour.
Let's say we begin our observation of the sun 12 noon in New York on September the 22nd. According to the heliocentric model, every 24 hour day the Earth is supposed to do an exact 360 degree spin on its axis and end up at the same place. That means that after 6 months, 12 noon in New York will arrive during the middle of the night on March the 21st. Under the heliocentric model, this occurrence should happen year in, year out, every year. However, this doesn't happen, which means the heliocentric model is wrong. That's what this is, a composite of data sets from several different instruments translated into a picture. So we actually had to take clouds out. They stashed the clouds for later, went onto the ocean. That came from an instrument that measures phytoplankton in the sea. Where it was low, I colored it dark blue because they're low mostly in mid-oceans. And then where it's a little bit higher, it was like a little bit brighter green. Then add the clouds back in. There's a small problem with it because there's a very slight gap in between each orbit. So some of those are painted on. It is photoshopped, but it's it's has to be. Then? There was another layer to sort of simulate the atmosphere. And then there's this little bright spot. It's called the specular highlight. So it's the reflection of sunlight off of water. Those are the pieces, but you can't just slap them all together. It just didn't look realistic. It looks kind of flat, or the clouds are sort of too see-through. So I just take Command Z a lot. There's artistry to creating the world. I've looked at these images over and over again, trying to sort of get the essence of it. It is photoshopped, but it's, it's, has to be. It is photoshopped, but it's, it's, has to be. It is photoshopped, but it's, it's, has to be.
spacecraft that's going to take humans to explore uh, the solar system. It's the next big step for NASA. Called the Orion Multipurpose Crew Vehicle, or MPCV, this next generation spacecraft will enable America to explore beyond low Earth orbit. This next generation spacecraft will enable America to explore beyond low Earth orbit. Today, the International Space Station is being used as a proving ground to conduct the research and test the technologies that will take humans beyond low Earth orbit and deeper into the solar system than ever before. It will take humans beyond low Earth orbit and deeper into the solar system than ever before. This that is much bigger than what we have today and it will be able to launch the Orion capsule with humans on board, as well as uh, landers or other uh, components to be to destinations beyond Earth orbit. Right now, we only can fly in Earth orbit. That's the farthest that we can go. And this new system that we're building is gonna allow us to go beyond and hopefully take humans into the solar system to explore. So the moon, Mars, asteroids, there's a lot of destinations that we could go to and we're building these building block components in order to allow us to do that eventually. And hopefully take humans into the solar system to explore. So the moon, Mars, asteroids, there's a lot of destinations that we could go to. And unlike the previous program, we are setting a course with specific and achievable milestones. Early in the next decade, a set of crewed flights will test and prove the systems required for exploration beyond low Earth orbit. Early in the next decade, a set of crewed flights will test and prove the systems required for exploration beyond low Earth orbit. Area of dangerous radiation. But Orion has protection. Shielding will be put to the test as the vehicle cuts through the waves of radiation. Sensors aboard will record radiation levels for scientists to study. We must solve these challenges before we send people through this region of space. We must solve these challenges before we send people through this region of space. Well, the sun neither rises nor sets, but travels in a clockwise circuit from east to west and only appears to rise and set due to perspective. The sun disappears at the vanishing point of human perspective on the horizon where the ground meets the sky. And since the sun is not 93 million miles away, I repeat, not 93 million miles away, but much closer and smaller, the light emanating from the sun only illuminates about half of the flat plane at once as it makes its daily journey. The sun is claimed to be 93 million miles away, with a radius of over 400,000 miles, but can easily be proven to be much closer and smaller by tracing the crepuscular rays back to its origin in the sky. If the sun were indeed 93 million miles away, it would simply be impossible to have angled sun rays as they should all consistently come in straight. The midnight sun also disproves heliocentrism. Places with the midnight sun are areas with 24-hour daylight. Now here we have a 360-degree panoramic time-lapse photograph which shows the path of the sun over the island of Lopa in the northern part of Norway between 7 p.m. July 21st and 6 p.m. July 22nd. 
This picture illustrates that in midsummer north of the Arctic, the sun stays above the horizon for 24 hours of the day. The photograph shows the sun as it makes a complete circle over the head of the photographer as he took one picture each hour during a 24 hour period. The photographer has inadvertently proved the sun circles over a flat earth. How so? Simple. The only way the sun would be seen to circle the observer on a globular spinning earth would be if the observer was standing directly over the North Pole. Any distance south of the North Pole should create a zigzag back and forth sun pattern in the sky if the earth were truly spinning and orbiting a 93 million mile distant sun. It's a common misconception that the shadow of the Earth causes moon phases. The interesting thing about moon phases is that they are always the exact same eight phases repeated. But if we were circling around the sun, these eight phases would inevitably be reversed from the summer to winter seasons. Yeah, you're going to see slightly more around it. It's a co obviously, they say it's a coincidence. The moon rotates on its own axis exactly the same time as it's all, exactly the same rate as it's orbiting around Earth, so we always see exactly the same um, face of it. But all that ever does, you see exactly that same face rotate. You don't see more around it, even five or ten degrees around it ever. All I'm saying, no, I'm sorry, but I mean, if you can, if you can produce evidence for me, then fair enough. All I'm saying. Yeah, is that it rotates. Yeah, there is no evidence so far, yeah, that we can see more around it. I mean, they've shown us the dark side of the moon. Oh, I'll, I'll come to that in a second. But all you ever see of the moon, and if you can, you know, by all, by all means get in touch, it rotates. It depends on where you are on the Earth. Yes, the moon has a different face, but it's not all it's on. It's rotated on one plane. It never rotates around us. <clears throat> you're looking at a ball that was all the way away, but if you're on that side, you're going to see just slightly different to that side. Doesn't matter how far. Well, I mean, it does obviously at some points, but the moon's fair. You know, it's a it's a fair distance. It's a it's a fair size in the sky. It's not a tiny dot like a star. We can see a fair bit of it. If you're thousands of miles that way and thousands of miles that way, and it's a ball, you're going to see a slightly different angle of it, aren't you? All it ever does is it rotates its face. So you're in Britain, you'll see it there. Move that way, you'll see it that way. And I'll show you, and you'll see it turning much upside down. That's all we ever see. We never see it turning that way. Polaris also proves the heliocentric model is pure fantasy. Polaris is the North Star and is allegedly fixed above the North Pole of the Earth. However, the problem is the North Star can be seen below the equator. Scientists want us to believe that the North Star is kept perfectly synchronized with the orbit of the Earth around the Sun while the Sun is supposedly traveling at speeds approximately 500 miles per hour around the Milky Way galaxy. Even more fantastic is the fact that scientists hypothesize that this Milky Way galaxy is racing through space at the speed ranging from 300,000 miles per hour to 1,340,000 miles per hour. The North Star not only proves that the Earth is flat, but that the heliocentric model is wrong.
Hey, dudes. Yeah, what are you doing here, man? Wow, that's a really good question, man. Yeah. I'm working on it, man. 